item one to the Senate Majority Press Availability, uh, March 20th, 2017, 8.30 a.m. We are two-thirds of the way through the first session of the 30th Legislature, and uh, Senate is uh, on schedule. We are working hard. We uh, do not have an operating budget from the other side at this point. Therefore, we are preparing our own. Senator uh, Hoffman's going to talk about that in just a moment. But uh, we talked about not having business as usual. That's our plan. We're going to continue with that as we get bills from the other side, we will certainly process them and hear them. If uh, we do not receive bills from the other side, we are going to present a plan of our own and hope that it's, uh, we receive the same courtesy as those bills get across um, to the other side. And, you know, we've talked about uh, what we're going to do on this um, little fiscal gap problem we have. The, the Senate has presented a bill, Senate Bill 26. Um, we are taking the advice of every economist that we had in the building that told us not to do everything at once. Um, we presented a bill that is a 95% solution, if you will, that uh, if we continue to keep the cost of government um, with downward pressure that meets the gap, and we're prepared to uh, deal with additional legislation if the um, price of oil does not stay the same or decreases dramatically or we have other economic issues that impact that ability to meet that gap. So um, we'll, I'll hand it off here to Senator McKinnon and uh, for a statement, then to Senator Hoffman and we'll be ready to take your questions. Certainly. Good morning. Uh, well, you know, it's uh, as the Majority Leader said we're two-thirds of the way through the session. The Senate has done exactly what we've said for the last three years. We've prioritized what will help Alaska uh, as soon as possible with the most impact, and that's the use of earnings from the permanent fund, not the dividend, but earnings from the permanent fund to face the challenge uh, that's before us. Uh, we listen to Alaskans from all across our state asking us to act on their behalf. There's a spending cap inside of uh, SB 26 that ins should ensure a stable framework to keep the budget growth down. Uh, the Senate will continue to go after cuts inside of the operating budget and ensure a dividend in the long term for all Alaskans. With that, I'll hand it off to Senator Hoffman. Good morning. Um, we finished public hearing process uh, on the operating budgets uh, last uh, Friday. Um, we had we heard from um, many people on many different issues, uh, but the, probably num the number one issue that people testified on was uh, public broadcasting, public radio, by far. You know, I think uh, the second uh, was education, um, <coughs> and uh, we still plan on trying to work with the other body. Hopefully, they can get their operating budget to us today. It's still the plan to uh, go the normal course. Uh, and use their budget, but as everyone is well aware, they are having uh, some issues on the, on the other side, which probably is normal for a, a young uh, 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 organization in, uh, as they have in the other body. But um, hopefully we can have uh, the operating budget on the floor on Friday or on, on the following Monday, which is still under normal circumstances uh, within the time frame that uh, that uh, we're dealing with the budget. The legislature, the Senate has concentrated on the four majors, uh, transportation, has university and education targeting 5%. Um, the what is online represents, uh, uh, in transportation, represents from the governor's amended uh, about a 5% reduction. The university and uh, the HES budgets also have 5% reduction in general fund. Um, it's anticipated that uh, education will um, be addressed in that uh, same uh, area of reductions, but to that is, uh, has, is and has always been um, a hot button point. But when you're looking at uh, the, the major four um, from FY15 uh, through the governor's budget, education uh, has received the, the lowest reduction of any department. Um, 
uh, or second lowest, judiciary being the, the lowest at 6.3 percent, uh, education at 7.9, and you have commerce receiving reductions in general funds of a whopping 54.3 percent. Um, and second to that is uh, uh, labor and workforce development mm -hmm. receiving a 37.3 percent reduction. So. I think by the virtue of the fact that uh, the education has has been spared um, many uh, budget uh, belt tightenings uh, shows how important that is, uh, and rightfully so. So we, uh, we will be addressing that uh, early this week and be finalizing uh, the, the state operating budget uh, uh, and have that on the floor as late as uh, Monday. Okay, thank you. Um, we can certainly go to questions at this point, if we have any questions. Austin? Um, Austin Baird from KTUU. On um, restructuring the permanent fund, one thing I'd like to uh, hear about, I guess, is why, why do you believe the state should rely on modeling that shows 6.9% returns over time? And why do you believe 5.25% is sustainable instead of a more conservative figure? Thank you for the question, Austin. Actually, uh, Callan, as well as the Department of Revenue and uh, Finance, say that there's a 1% uh, failure rate. It's the best model that we have out there with what we've proposed is 5.25 5 draw for the first three years and then dropping down to a 5%. So it's sustainable uh, and it's uh, durable. And to, to follow up on that, that was one of my questions to Commissioner Hoffbeck as well, because uh, that gave me concerns. And um, his response was that if he believes that it is durable as well, but if there uh, is a slight chance that there is a failure, he said that he would be the first one to recommend to the governor to come back to the legislature to address it. So it is a, a point of uh, concern. But uh, from the modeling and from the recommendations of the professionals, they say that it's in, within the means. If I might follow up, um, also the effective uh, draw rate is much lower. It's 4.4 to 4.7 over the, the years that have been modeled. So, um, and, t and we have a three-year review in there to take a look at it. So I just put that on the record that there's an effective rate that is much lower. So just to have one more comparison to throw out there, our entire PERS, TERS program is based on an 8% return, which does worry us because it's an actual. So this is an effective rate, much lower than 5.25% for three years and then lower than 5% aft on out past three years. So it's a conservative rate. Um, as my two uh, partners here have stated, um, all of the experts um, have ensured that, uh, have assured us that uh, it's an adequately uh, conservative rate and we will certainly keep a close eye on it if, if something changes economically that reverses that model. Part, part of the reason I ask is because, uh, I mean, the experts were dramatically wrong, obviously, on oil price projections. Revenue department has been dramatically wrong on revenue projections within just the past three years. So, I mean, why, I guess, why do you accept information that's being presented to you is accurate this time? Well, it's, 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 you have to rely upon someone to make your decisions, and these are the best in the field. And uh, if you don't listen to them, then who do you listen to? You know, we, we pay uh, uh, sums of money to hear from the experts and uh, uh, not to heed their advice. So Austin, if you think about returns on in investments, um, if, if the number of 6.95% is in danger, then so is all traditional investment uh, programs throughout the US, actually throughout the planet. Your question was based on a single commodity price. Um, investment returns are based on thousands of ty types of investments from real estate to commodities. So that's what levels off that difference. And we're still more conservative than many of the retirement programs that are expecting a higher rate. Again, the, the effective rate is the most important number here. And if you include years, that include things like the Great Depression um, over time, that's um, a, still a relatively conservative rate. So it would have to be an entire f an absolute failure of our economic system, which is possible, I suppose, 
um, but it would be unprecedented and is completely unexpected. We have to base it on a historical number that's safe, and that's what we've done in consultation with the experts. Yes, Matt. Good morning, Matt Hurst with Alaska Dispatch News. Um, the House in Biden this week has scheduled like a full week of hearings on the oil tax legislation. Um, should the Senate be starting to advance its own oil tax legislation, given that it's taken the House 60 days to get its oil tax legislation this far? Well, Matt, you missed the intro, um, but we talked about that a little bit. Um, the fact is we are going to charge forward if, if nothing comes across that is substantive. So you can look at, we've gotten 26 across the finish line. We're, in fact, just about ready to send a budget over if we don't receive one in the next couple of days. And it will be the same with those other big pieces of legislation. If the House, and I'm not here to ding the House, um, but they're a new organization. They haven't held the reins in a long time. And uh, I think they're, they're struggling with uh, some of these larger policy calls. Um, if we don't see something coming soon, you're going to see bills come across on all the major issues that must be dealt with this year. I would just add that um, our members are familiar with the oil tax policy debate, so I, I expect that we would be uh, more nimble and ready to move. So, so you view oil, oil taxes as an issue that needs attention from the Senate, regardless of whether the House passes its own legislation? Well, we, as Alaskans, we like to just say oil taxes. It's just kind of a fun way of talking about the entire system. Um, we believe that there's some exposure on oil credits that we're willing to look at, just like we were willing to deal with it through HB 247 last year that didn't receive a lot of coverage but reduced the exposure to the state by about $450 million a year. So we're certainly looking to um, sharpen the program so it's best for the state but still encourages investment. Um, so when you say oil taxes, um, we don't see a lot of need for correction. Senate Bill 21 is obviously working. We heard it from both sides of the aisle last week during the Senate Bill 26 discussion. Um, but we do uh, admit that we have some credit exposures on a cash flow basis that we would like to improve. Are those the North Slope credits? Uh, they're the only remaining credits, yes. <laughs> yes. Shauna Crandall, Alaska Education Update. Can you address the level of criticism you've received over not having any funding in the budget for education since you introduced the committee substitute? Well, when we commit, um, when we did that, uh, I did not want to uh, put in a, a number um, that didn't have support and so it, it's under discussion and I've uh, stated that uh, numerous times during the public hearing process and I think the people have uh, that testified have acknowledged that because they referred to the 5% uh, uh, no one agreeing with that amount of level of cuts and just virtually everyone that mentioned it uh, had concerns that it is too high but acknowledging that uh, uh, several of them acknowledge that 5% uh, seemed small, but in the bigger uh, scheme of things is a large number because uh, education uh, receives top dollar in the state. James. Uh, James Brooks from the Juno Empire. One of the things we saw passed in the House on the floor as an amendment was the cuts to per diem. And I was curious what your thoughts were on 